The seven fallacies of relevance that we will be specifically dealing with are appeal to force, appeal to pity, appeal to the people, and appeal to the people, we're only going to be concentrating on the, the indirect appeal to the people, and there are three versions of this kind, which is the bandwagon, appeal to vanity, and the appeal to snobbery. We'll also be dealing with accident, argument against the person, and there are actually three different types of argument against the person, abusive, circumstantial, and two coquet straw man, and red herring. So let's turn to appeal to force. An appeal to force is the name of a fallacious argument. However, an appeal to force actually shares the same framework or form as non-fallacious arguments. This framework or form is as follows. The premises makes a threat, either physical or otherwise, and the conclusion asserts that one should accept the truth of some statement X. Now the reasoning of this kind of form or framework is that you should accept the truth of the statement X based on the threat that is being made in the premises. Now our example one is an actual example of a fallacious appeal to force. Here you have the argument you know you didn't see me cheating because if you did you might regret you came to school that day. The premise of this argument is, if you did see me cheating, you might regret that you came to school that day. This premise implies a threat. The conclusion is that you didn't see me cheating. Now this argument is a fallacious argument and so has weak reasoning. The reason why this argument has weak reasoning is because the premise is irrelevant to the truth of the conclusion. Now the conclusion is that you didn't see me cheating. And if you think about it, the fact that someone is threatening you with some kind of physical violence or otherwise is no reason to believe that it's true that you did or did not see something. What might be good reasons to believe that it's true that you did or did not see something? Now it might be the case that being threatened in some form or another is a good reason for you to deny that you had seen something. So in other words, a threat might be a good motivation for you to lie about seeing something. However, the threat itself would not be a good reason to believe that it's true that you didn't see something. So there's a difference here between something being a good reason for motivating you to do something and something being a good reason for the truth of something. So although the threat that's being used in the premise of this argument might be effective in motivating someone to deny that they have seen something, specifically that they saw someone cheating, the threat is not a reason that supports the fact that it's true that one did not see someone cheating. Now here in our example two, we actually have an example of a argument that has the same form of the appeal to force, but it is not a fallacious argument. This argument argues, if you get caught cheating at Clemson University, you might get a zero on the assignment or even get suspended from school. Since getting a good GPA is important to you, you probably shouldn't risk things by cheating. The first premise of this argument is, if you get caught cheating at Clemson University, you might get a zero on the assignment or even get suspended from school. Now notice how this premise implies a threat. The second premise is the premise that getting a good GPA is important to you. And the conclusion is that you probably shouldn't risk things by cheating. Now, although this argument relies on a threat that's being made in the first premise, this threat is actually relevant to the conclusion. 
that you might get a zero on an assignment or even get suspended from school is a relevant reason to support the truth of the fact that you probably shouldn't risk things by cheating. Especially if it's also true that getting a good GPA is important to you. So this argument, although it has the same form of a fallacious appeal to force, is actually not a fallacious appeal to force. It is a strong argument, and it actually doesn't have a name of its own. So we would simply refer to it as a strong inductive argument. So if you look at the bottom here, I've given you an illustration in order to help you conceptualize an appeal to force along with its relationship to the form or framework and the strength of the argument as well as non-fallacious arguments. So let me explain how this illustration works. The red line that you see here represents a single form or framework. So that red line represents the form or framework where the premises makes a threat, physical or otherwise, and the conclusion asserts that one should accept the truth of some statement X. Now you find on one end of this red line the degree of strength weak. And you find on the other end of the red line the degree of strength strong. So you'll see that on each end of this red line, which represents the form of the argument given, you have the strength that this kind of argument might have. You might have a weak argument of this form or a strong argument of this form. I've also given you in parentheses the reason for why you would have a weak argument of this form and why you would have a strong argument of this form. For the form that is used by the appeal to force, you would have a weak version of this form when it's the case that the threat being used in the premise is irrelevant to the truth of the conclusion. And you would have a strong argument of this form if the threat that's being used in the premise is actually relevant to the truth of the conclusion and provides a good reason to believe that the conclusion is true. Furthermore, you have on each end the names that are associated with either the strong or weak version of this form or framework. The weak version of this form or framework is referred to as an appeal to force, and the strong version of this framework or form does not have a name. So we would simply refer to it as a strong inductive argument. So this illustration shows you that there is one form or framework that's associated with an appeal to force and that the appeal to force refers to the weak version of this framework. However, it also shows you that there is a strong version of the same framework which has no name attached to it. Now, in other types of informal fallacies that we will be going through, I offer you similar kinds of illustrations. So the way these illustrations work will basically be the same, except for some, there will be certain differences, and I'll explain those differences when we get to them. Let's now move on to the appeal to pity. An appeal to pity is a fallacious argument that uses as its premise an empathetic or sympathetic emotional response from the listener in order to support a conclusion which asserts that one should accept the truth of some statement. So the reasoning behind an appeal to pity is to try to manipulate someone to accept that some statement is true by making that person or giving that person reasons to feel bad or sad or something of that sort. Now here is an example of a fallacious appeal to pity. The example one reads, Your Honor, before you sentence my client for the murder of his parents, I ask you to consider his situation. He is an orphan. 
Perhaps you can give him the lightest punishment possible. Now, the premise of this argument is that he is an orphan. And the conclusion is perhaps you can give him the lightest punishment possible. The reason why this is a weak argument is because the premise is actually irrelevant to the truth of the conclusion. What the premise, he is an orphan, is trying to do is get the listener, in this case the judge, to be, feel bad or sorry for the defendant. And it relies on this feeling of this emotional response to support the truth of the conclusion that um, the defendant should get the lightest punishment possible. However, if you think about it, feeling bad or sorry for someone is not a good reason to think that it's true that the person should get a light punishment for whatever action that they did. So in this case, the emotional appeal that's being used in the premises does not actually support the truth of the conclusion because it is irrelevant to the truth of the conclusion, which makes this a weak argument and fallacious. On the other hand, in example two, we have an argument that is actually a strong argument of this form. The argument reads, your mother is not doing very well in the hospital. She keeps asking for you. You should probably go see her when you have the chance. The first premise is your mother is not doing very well in the hospital. And the second premise is she keeps asking for you. Both of these premises are intended to incite an emotional response of sympathy or sadness or even guilt. And these emotional responses are then used to support the conclusion that you should probably go see your mother when you have a chance. Now, if you think about the premises and the conclusion for this argument, it's actually the case that the premises are relevant to the truth of the conclusion. That you feel bad or sad or even guilty about the fact that your mother is in the hospital and not doing well and is constantly asking for you is actually a good reason for why you should probably go see your mother in the hospital. So this is actually a strong argument. However, this argument has no name of its own, so we would simply refer to this as a strong inductive argument. Now once again, I've offered you an illustration on the bottom to show you what the relationship is between the names of the fallacious argument and the form and the strength of the argument, etc. Now, Again, this fallacious argument has a form, one single form, which is represented by the red line that is associated with not only this fallacious argument, but also with a strong version of this argument. So the former framework for this fallacious argument actually has strong versions and weak versions. The weak version is referred to as the appeal to pity, which is the fallacy. And it's weak because the emotions that are incited in the premises are irrelevant to the conclusion. The strong version has no name, so we simply refer to it as a strong inductive argument. And the reason why it would be strong is that the emotions incited are relevant to the truth of the conclusion. So here, as with the appeal to force, we have one framework that are shared by two versions of this form, a weak and a strong version. So here, as with appeals to force, we have one form or framework that can have weak versions and strong versions. And the weak version is associated with the fallacious type of this form, and the strong version actually has no name. Our next informal fallacy is 
the appeal to the people. Now the appeal to the people actually has a general form or framework that applies to all types of appeal to the people. However, we can further divide this category of appeal to the people to even more specific types of appeal to people. Now your book separates appeal to the people into two categories, direct appeal to the people and indirect appeal to the people. And then it divides indirect appeal to the people to three more categories, the bandwagon, appeal to vanity, and appeal to snobbery. We are only going to deal with the three specific categories that are under the indirect appeal to the people. So you don't actually have to worry about direct appeal to the people. So the framework or form of all three of these appeals to the people, bandwagon, appeal to vanity, appeal to snobbery, is as follows. The premises incites one's desire to belong by noting that many people or some elite group of people believe that some statement X is true or that one would be admired by others if one believed that some statement X is true. Then the conclusion asserts that one should accept the truth of some statement X. Now in example one, again, we have an example of the fallacious version of this type of form. So here we have the argument, you should buy some Nike Air Jordans. Everyone is wearing them these days. The premise of this argument is everyone is wearing them these days. Notice how in this sense we are appealing to many people, what everyone is doing. Then the conclusion concludes you should buy some Nike Air Jordans. So the conclusion is asserting that it's true that you should buy some Nike Air Jordans. Now the reasoning of this argument is weak and the name of this argument specifically is the appeal to the people bandwagon. Now the reason why the argument is a weak argument is because the premise being used is actually irrelevant to the truth of the conclusion. The fact that many people or everyone is wearing Nike Air Jordans is not a good reason to believe that it's true that you should buy some Nike Air Jordans. Consider what might be good reasons for why you should buy Nike Air Jordans. Perhaps because you like Nike Air Jordans, because they are very comfortable, or because they are high performance shoes, or something of the sort. Now these might be good reasons, but the fact that everyone else is wearing Nike Air Jordans will never be a reason for why it's true that you should buy Nike Air Jordans. So here the premise inciting a desire in one to belong by noting that many people are doing the same thing is not a reason for you to think that the conclusion is true. Now this specific fallacy is the bandwagon fallacy because it incites one's desire to belong by noting that many people believe in some statement X. If it's the case that the argument were to appeal to an elite group of people, then this would be an appeal to snobbery. And if the argument were to note that one would be admired by various people if they believed that some statement X were true, then this would be an appeal to vanity. Now, there's actually no strong version of this specific form or framework However, there is a strong version of an inductive argument that may seem similar to this kind of form or framework. So consider the example that we have here, example two. This argument argues everyone on this street is running the other direction, seemingly afraid for their lives. Maybe I should start running the other direction too. The premise of this argument is that everyone on the street is running the other direction seemingly afraid for their lives. And the conclusion is maybe I should start running the other direction too. Now although this seems to be 
something like an appeal to people because the premise seems to cite the fact that everyone is doing something, in this case running a certain direction. This argument actually does not have the same form or framework as an appeal to the people. The reason for that is because although this argument uses the fact that other people are doing something as a reason for you to do something, what it's not doing is it's not using the fact that other people are doing something in order to take advantage of your desire to belong to a group. For an appeal to the people, noting that other people believe something to be true or that you would be admired if you believe something to be true is being used in order to incite the listener's desire to belong to a certain group. And then it's that desire to belong that is being used as a reason for why you should accept the truth of a certain statement. In our example two here, the the fact that other people are doing something is being used as evidence for why you should probably do the same thing. And although it's the case that not every argument that has this structure will be a strong argument, in this case you have a strong inductive argument. The reason that everyone is running the other direction is not being used in order to play off of the listener's desire to belong to a group of people. What the second argument is actually doing is it's using the premise that everyone on the street is running the other direction, seemingly afraid for their lives in order to suggest a second implicit premise, which is that there exists something of danger which everyone is running away from. And it is this second premise, along with the first premise, that supports the conclusion that maybe I should start running the other direction too. So here you have a case of an argument where you have a premise about what everybody else is doing or thinking that actually is relevant to the conclusion of that argument. Not only this, but it provides good reasons for the truth of this specific conclusion. So here we have a strong argument, and it's an inductive argument. However, this argument actually has no name that is attached to it. So we would simply refer to it as a strong inductive argument. Now if you look below here, you see a little illustration of what's going on with the fallacy of appeal to the people. Now notice how again we have the red line which represents the form or framework associated with appeal to the people. Now on one side of that red line, you have weak arguments and they're weak because the appeal to others is irrelevant. And all these weak arguments are referred to as fallacies of appeal to the people. Furthermore, these fallacies of appeals to the people will be divided into three different categories. Bandwagon, appeal to vanity, and appeal to snobbery. Now on the other side of the red line, you see that there's an X that is on top of strong and does not exist. Now what this is saying is that for the specific framework or form for the appeal to the people, there is no strong version of this form. Furthermore, because there is no strong version of this form, there is no name that exists that goes along with this kind of strong version, because the strong version doesn't exist. However, once again, as example two suggests, there are strong inductive arguments that are similar to the form or framework of an appeal to the people, but these arguments don't have the exact same form or framework as an appeal to people. And the reason for this is because these arguments don't actually rely on one's desire to belong to a group in order to argue for the truth of a certain claim. 
Our next fallacy is referred to as an accident. And an accident has a form where the premises cites at least one rule of some kind. And the conclusion misapplies the rule, often due to taking the rule out of its appropriate context. Now let's look at our example here. So here we have an example which illustrates the form or the framework for the accident. The example argues, I can't believe that the police didn't give the driver of that ambulance any citations. The driver was speeding, the driver went through a red light, the ambulance swerved from lane to lane without using any turn signals. Now, the premises of this argument is the driver was speeding, the driver went through a red light, the ambulance swerved from lane to lane without using any turn signals, as well as it is illegal to speed, drive through a red light, and swerve from lane to lane without signaling. This fourth premise is actually an implicit premise held by this argument, and we have made it explicit here by writing it out explicitly as a premise. Then the conclusion concludes, the police should have given the driver of that ambulance at least one citation. And this conclusion is actually implied by the statement, I can't believe that the police didn't give the driver of that ambulance any citations. Now notice in this argument, a rule is being misapplied. So the rule that's being misapplied is stated as the fourth premise implicitly, that it is illegal to speed, drive through a red light, and swerve from lane to lane without using signals. Now, this rule only applies to regular drivers. It doesn't actually apply to ambulances. But the conclusion ends up applying this rule to ambulances in order to conclude that the police should have given the driver of that ambulance at least one citation. So here we have an example of an accident where a rule is of some kind is being cited in the premises and then misapplied in the conclusion. And usually this misapplication is due to taking the rule out of its appropriate context. This kind of argument will always have weak reasoning, and the name of this kind of argument will always be the accident. Note that there is no strong version of this kind of argument. In other words, the form or the framework of this argument does not have any strong version associated with it. The reason why is that any time someone uses a rule but then misapplies that rule, in the conclusion, you will never have an argument where the premises are actually relevant to the conclusion being drawn. The reason for that is because there's a misapplication of the rule being cited. And misapplications do not provide good reasoning such that the premises will in fact support the conclusion. So in this case, you will not have a strong version of this type of form. And this is illustrated in the little diagram that we have below. Below, you'll find a diagram which illustrates the fact that the form or the framework of the accident does not actually have a strong version. And that the only version of an accident which exists is the weak version. Once again, you see that you have the red line, which represents the form or the framework for the accident. And on one side of that red line, you see the strength of the argument, which is weak, and the name of arguments with weak reasoning that have this form or framework are referred to as accidents. And then on the other side of that red line, where you would have strong versions of this former framework, there's a giant red X that's on top of that. What this is indicating is that there isn't any argument of this kind of framework or form which has strong reasoning. The green circle then indicates to you that the only type of arguments that exist of this former framework are the ones that are weak, which are called accidents. Now the, now the next three informal fallacies that we're going to discuss are actually counterarguments. And we've discussed what counterarguments are previously in the past lectures. 
However, to review, counterarguments are arguments that are given in response to previously given arguments. Now, counterarguments will have characteristics that you should be aware of. The first is that because all counterarguments are arguments that are given in response to previously given arguments, all counterarguments will require a previously given argument that is being responded to. So if an argument is not responding to a previously given argument, then it's not a counterargument. Furthermore, counterarguments will always conclude that the audience should reject the previously given argument. It will conclude that either you should reject the conclusion of the previously given argument or you should reject some reason that the previously given argument relies on and so therefore reject the conclusion of the previously given argument. Finally, the conclusion is often implied rather than explicitly stated. Now, it's not going to be the case that the conclusion is always implied rather than explicitly stated, but in many cases you'll find that the conclusion is implied instead of explicitly stated. So what you'll have to do is make these implicit conclusions explicit when evaluating the counterarguments. An argument against the person is the first informal fallacy that is a counterargument that we will discuss. Now, an argument against the person actually has a general framework where the premises attack the author of the previously given argument by attacking some aspect of that person's character, nature, motives, or noting that the person is being hypocritical. Then as the conclusion, it concludes that one should reject the previously given argument. Now, although there's one general form or framework for an argument against the person, you could further divide argument against the persons into three separate categories. These three categories are ad hominem abusive, ad hominem circumstantial, and to coquet. Now, when it's the case that an argument against the person attacks the character or nature or something of this form of the author of the previously given argument, in order to reject the conclusion of that previously given argument, this would be an ad hominem abusive. When it's the case that an argument against the person instead attacks the motive of the author of the previously given argument, we have then a case of ad hominem circumstantial. And finally, if it's the case that the argument against the person actually notes that the author of the previously given argument is being hypocritical, then you have a case of a two quo K. Now let us look at our example here, example one, which is an example of an argument against the person, specifically an ad hominem abusive. Now this argument states, Lana argued that we should hire her for the accounting position because she is well qualified and has lots of experience. But Lana is a convicted child molester. How can we possibly hire her as an accountant? Now this argument has as its first premise the statement, Lana argued that we should hire her for the accounting position because she is well qualified and has lots of experience. Now notice how this actually restates a previously given argument. So the first premise is indicating that the argument that's being provided here is a counter argument and that it is a counter argument to the argument that is being summarized by the first premise. Then the second premise states, but Lana is a convicted child molester. Now notice how this second premise actually attacks the character or quality of the author of the previously given argument. Lana is the author of the argument that she should be hired for the accounting position. And premise two attacks Lana by saying that she is a convicted child molester. Then the conclusion concludes that we should not hire Lana as our accountant. 
And this is actually implied by the rhetorical question, how can we possibly hire her as an accountant? So this question is actually a statement in the form of a question, and the statement is, we should not hire Lana as our accountant. Now notice how this is actually a fallacious argument because the premises do not support the conclusion. Specifically, the premise that Lana is a convicted child molester does not support the conclusion that we should not hire Lana as our accountant. Now the reason for that is because being a convicted child molester has no credence or significance on whether or not one should be hired as an accountant. Furthermore, what this argument is doing is rejecting the conclusion of the previously given argument. And that previously given argument is the argument given by Lana that she should be hired for the accounting position. Now this argument here is rejecting this conclusion based on the reason that the character or quality of the person giving that argument is flawed in some way. What it's not doing is it's not looking at the actual previously given argument and using an evaluation of that argument in order to reject the conclusion of that argument. So here we have a case where instead of looking at the merits of the previously given argument in order to reject the conclusion of that previously given argument, we have instead an attack on the character or quality of the author of the previously given argument in order to reject the conclusion of that previously given argument. Now, citing problems with an author of a given argument is, in most cases, irrelevant to whether or not we should accept or reject the actual argument given by that person. So this is why arguments against the people are actually weak arguments where the premises are irrelevant to the truth of the conclusion. However, you can have strong versions of this form where the attack on the person's character of the previously given argument is actually relevant to the conclusion being drawn. For example, consider example number two. Example 2 argues, Lana argued that we should hire her for the 5th grade teaching position because she is well qualified and has lots of experience. But Lana is a convicted child molester. How can we possibly hire her as a teacher? Now the first premise of this argument is, Lana argued that we should hire her for the 5th grade teaching position. Note that this first premise, like example one, is restating or summarizing the previous argument that was given that this argument is responding to. Then the second premise states, but Lana is a convicted child molester. And here we have the second premise attacking the character, nature, or qualities of the author of the previously given argument. Remember, Lana is the one who gave the argument that she should be hired for the position as a fifth grade teacher. The conclusion then concludes that we should not hire Lana as a teacher, which is basically the rejection of the conclusion of the previously given argument. This conclusion is implied by the rhetorical question, how can we possibly hire her as a teacher? Now notice how in this case we have actually an example of a strong inductive argument. The reasons given in this case specifically that Lana is a convicted child molester is actually very relevant to the truth of the conclusion that we should not hire Lana as a teacher. Because this premise is not only relevant but also in its relevance gives us good reason to think that the conclusion is true, this is a strong inductive argument. Now this argument as a strong inductive argument does not have a name. So we simply refer to strong inductive arguments with this form as a strong inductive argument. 
So here again, we have an illustration of the form of the argument against the person and its relationship with its name and strength. So as this diagram illustrates, the single form or framework that is associated with argument against the person has on one end arguments that are weak versions of this form and on the other end arguments that are strong versions of this form. The weak versions are weak because the attack that is being used in the premises are not relevant. And the strong versions are strong because the attacks that are being used in the premises are actually relevant. Furthermore, the weak versions are referred to as arguments against the person, and the strong version has no name. So we simply refer to them as strong inductive arguments. Our second informal fallacy that is a counter-argument is the straw man. The straw man has as its form premises which distorts a previously given argument so that it is more easily attackable and then criticizes the new distorted version of the previously given argument. Then the conclusion concludes that one should reject the previously given argument. Once again, it's often the case, but not always the case, that the conclusion is implied rather than explicitly stated. So let's look at our example here. Our example argues that Mr. K argued that watching too much television is bad for you. But that's just silly to suggest that we should never watch television. There are a lot of educational programs that are good for us, and how are we to get the news? Mr. K is obviously being ridiculous. Now, this argument has several premises. The first premise is the premise that Mr. K argued that watching too much television is bad for you. This is actually the summary of the original argument that was given by Mr. K in which the straw man argument is responding to. The second premise states that's just silly to suggest that we should never watch television. This second premise is actually a summary of the previously given argument, but in a distorted form. So what this second premise is doing is it's taking the original argument and reinterpreting it so that it is in a weaker form. This reinterpretation of the previously given argument is referred to as the straw man because it's actually not the argument that the original arguer submitted to the audience. It is a different argument that has been created by taking the original argument and changing it so that it becomes a weaker argument. Then the third premise states, there are a lot of educational programs that are good for us. Notice how this third premise is actually attacking the straw man. It's criticizing the previously given argument in its distorted form and not its original form. So premise two recharacterizes the original argument into a distorted form, which makes it seem that the original argument suggested that we should never watch television. Then the third premise attacks this argument, which is the straw man. Also, the fourth premise states that we won't be able to watch the news, which is implied by the statement, how are we to get the news? And this fourth premise is also attacking the distorted version of the original argument, which is presented in the second premise. Note again how the second premise suggests that the original argument is arguing that we should never watch television. Finally, the conclusion concludes that we should reject the conclusion of the original argument. This is implied by the statement, Mr. K is obviously being ridiculous. The reason why this is a fallacious argument is because this argument concludes that we should reject the conclusion of the previously given argument. 
However, the reasons that it gives in support of this conclusion is the fact that there are flaws with not the originally given argument, but a distorted version of that originally given argument. Now, you can't actually conclude that you should reject the conclusion of any previously given argument based on problems that are associated with not the original argument, but a distorted version of that original argument. Essentially, what is going on in this kind of argument is that it's suggesting that we should reject the conclusion of a specific argument based on problems with a completely different argument. Notice that in the premises, the problems or issues that are being given as reasons to reject the previously given argument are problems or criticisms of not the original argument, but a different distorted version of the original argument. Because the problems and criticisms being noted in the premises are not actually about the previously given argument, but a distorted version of that argument, those criticisms or problems are not applicable to the original argument itself. And so a conclusion rejecting the conclusion of the original argument is not supportable by the premises which cite such problems. Now this argument, as we've discussed, has weak reasoning and is referred to as the straw man. And there are no strong versions of this kind of argument because the form or framework of this argument is such that you can never have a strong version which meets this form or framework. The premises will always be premises that will distort a previously given argument and then attack that distorted version. And the conclusion will always be the rejection, not of the distorted version of the previously given argument, but of the previously given argument itself. So you'll always have a case where the premises are irrelevant to the truth of the conclusion. So as our diagram here illustrates, this specific form or framework on the one side will have weak versions which are referred to as the straw man. And on the other side where you would have strong versions, such versions do not exist. Our third informal fallacy that is a counterargument is the red herring. The red herring has as its form or framework premises where the arguer responds to a previously given argument by changing the subject. Then the conclusion asserts or implies that we should reject the previously given argument or that the concerns of the previously given argument have been addressed. Now let's look at our example here which illustrates a red herring. This example argues many people criticize TV as turning America into an illiterate society, but how can we criticize the very medium that is the envy of countries all over the world? The entertainment quality and variety of the TV programs today is greater than ever before. Not to mention there is an enormous number of cable options available to members of the viewing audience. Now, the premise of this argument is that Many people criticize TV as turning America into an illiterate society. Notice that this first premise is actually a summary or restatement of the previously given argument that this red herring is responding to. Then the second premise is that the entertainment quality and variety of the TV programs today is greater than ever before. Now notice how this premise here is actually changing the subject in a very slight way compared to what is being spoken of in the previously given argument. The previously given argument is talking about television turning America into an illiterate society. But premise two is instead talking about 
the entertainment quality and variety of TV programs that are available in U.S. television. Premise 3 states that not to mention the enormous number of cable options available to members of the viewing audience. Notice how this premise as well is actually slightly changing the subject rather than being concerned with what the previously given argument was actually concerned with. Again, notice how the previously given argument, as stated in premise 1, was concerned with TV turning America into an illiterate society. But the third premise is concerned with the enormous number of cable options available to Americans. This has nothing to do with television turning America into an illiterate society. Then finally, the conclusion concludes that we should not criticize American television. And this is implied by the statement, which is a rhetorical question, how can we criticize the very medium that is the envy of countries all over the world? Now this argument is very similar to the straw man in the sense that the reason why this is a weak argument is that what it does in the premises is to not actually address the previously given argument in order to, in the conclusion, reject the conclusion of the previously given argument. However, unlike the straw man, what this argument does in the premises is to simply change the subject rather than reconceive the previously argument into a weaker form and then attacking that argument, which is what the straw man does. So in the red herring, you have instead of a distortion of a previously given argument and then attacking that distorted version, reasons given which are completely irrelevant to the concerns of the previously given argument. But the conclusion actually suggests that we should reject the previously given argument. So once again, you have a case where the premises are irrelevant to the conclusion because the premises do not directly address the merits of the previously given argument in order to reject the previously given argument in the conclusion. Now once again, this argument has weak reasoning and the argument is referred to as a red herring. Furthermore, there is no strong version of an argument with this form or framework. So as the diagram below illustrates, with this form or framework, on one side you will have arguments that have this form or framework with weak reasoning. And all of these arguments are referred to as red herrings. On the other side of this former framework, where you might have strong arguments using this former framework, these actually do not exist, which is why we have a big red X on top of this area here. So all the arguments that have the form or framework of the red herring will be weak arguments, and they will all be referred to as red herrings. Now, as I have mentioned, many people actually confuse straw men with red herring. So let's look at these two types of arguments side by side so we can get an understanding of how they are different. Now, both the red herring and the straw man will, as one of its premises, present a summary of the original argument that the straw man or red herring is responding to. This is also going to be the case with the argument against the person. The reason why these arguments do this is because they are counter arguments. However, notice what's going on in the other premises between the straw man and the red herring. In the straw man, you have as premise two a distortion of the previously given argument. 
this distorted version of the previously given argument is referred to as the straw man. In other words, it's the fake argument that's being attacked. Then in premise three, you have an attack or a criticism of the distorted version of the previously given argument. This is also occurring in premise four, which again attacks the distorted version of the previously given argument. Then in the conclusion, you have the rejection of the previously given argument. So here in the straw man, the most important thing to realize is that you have a distortion of the previously given argument as one of the premises, then attacks against or criticisms of the distorted version of the previously given argument as the other premises. On the other hand, the red herring will give as one of its premises a change in the subject matter in order to conclude that we should reject the conclusion of the previously given argument or in order to suggest that the concerns of the previously given argument have been settled. Notice how the second premise of the red herring states that the entertainment quality and variety of TV programs today is greater than ever bef before. And the third premise states that there is enormous number of cable options available to members of the viewing audience. These two premises have nothing to do with the concerns of the original argument, which was about, as premise one suggests, TV turning America into a literate society. So the premises that are being used in the red herring are actually irrelevant to the conclusion which suggests that we should reject the previously given argument because these premises are actually not related in any way to the previously given argument. They are subtle changes in the subject. So these are two completely different arguments with two completely different forms. However, many people often confuse these because both of these arguments, number one, summarizes the previously given argument, and number two, in the conclusion, rejects the conclusion of the previously given argument. However, these two features of the straw man and the red herring are not features that are distinct to these specific forms. In other words, these two features are not defining features of the straw man or the red herring. The straw man and the red herring have these two features not because they are straw man and the red herring, but because they are counter arguments. The distinctive defining features of the straw man has to do with what's going on in premise 2, 3, and 4, where you have a straw man being created of the original argument, then an attack or attacks of that straw man argument, which is the distorted version of the original argument. For the red herring, the defining features of the red herring is what's going on in premise two and three, where you have a change in the subject that's being used as a reason to conclude that we should reject the previously given argument.